will now begin the first session titled U.S.-China Relations, A New Cold War at the Crossroads. Please welcome six distinguished speakers and a moderator to the stage. Former U.S. Ambassador to China, Stapleton Roy. Former Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, Daniel Russell. Professor and former Dean of the School of International Studies of Peking University, Jia Qingwo. Executive Director of China Center for Collaborative Studies of the South China Sea at Nanjing University, Zhu Feng. Former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Yun Yongguan. Professor of Aju University, Kim Hung Gyu. And the moderator, Chairman of East Asia Institute, Ha Yong Sun. We'll receive questions from the audience for this session as well. Please raise your hand to submit your question or if you need more question sheets. Good morning. Congratulations on the inaugural conference of the Che Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, the first session for this conference will focus on the topic of U.S.-China relations, a new cold, unquote, quote, a new cold war at the crossroad, unquote. Uh, the first session will possibly discuss three major questions. The first question as the future of U.S.-China relations. Looking back the past of U.S.-China relations about a decade ago, we did talk about the dream of the American age, but the reality turns out the other way. Last year, we had two key long speeches on U.S.-China relations, as previously mentioned in the pre, pre uh, preliminary sessions. From the U.S. side, Vice President Pence remarks on Trump's policy toward China. And from the China side, President Xi Jinping's address on Xi's thought on diplomacy of socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new year. They shows us that the future of U.S.-China relations are now facing three-way intersection of further deterioration, status quo, and improvement. The second question we would like to discuss as more specifically relations between, between U.S. and China in the Asia Pacific. U.S. President Trump pursues in the Pacific rebalance strategy based on the two principles of America first and peace through strength. In parallel, Chinese President Xi Jinping conducts new type of neighborhood relationships based on three basic principles of community of common destiny for mankind as legitimacy, diplomacy, one belt, one road as an interest diplomacy, and the pursuit of essential interest with the rising military capabilities. Under these circumstances, how can we resolve the contending issues in three major hot spots, such as the Korean Peninsula, East China Sea, and also South China Sea? The final question is about new operating system for Asia Pacific reason to avoid a Cold War between U.S. and China. It seems that the current efforts of both Trump and Xi Jinping to answer this question will not be very successful. To discuss these kind of difficult questions, we invited six leading, globally leading experts on this issue. So our session will start from uh, Ambassador Stapleton Roy, he did involve in U.S.-China relations more than half century. I think it is very rare chances for here his uh, wisdom on the 
present and future of U.S.-China relations. Ambassador. Uh, thank you, Professor Ha and President Park and Chairman Che. Thank you for making this inaugural conference possible. Forty years after the establishment of U.S.-China relations, two years into the Trump administration, and a year and a half after the 19th Party Congress in China, the foundations for a constructive U.S.-China relationship are more fragile than at any time in recent decades. Hostile rivalry between China and the United States will adversely affect the interests of all of the countries of East Asia. If Washington and Beijing cannot reconcile their respective interests and ambitions in the Western Pacific, this will increase the possibility of military confrontations, divert resources from economic development to a dangerous and costly arms race, enhance the likelihood of nuclear proliferation, and increase pressures on the countries of East Asia to choose sides. No country will benefit from such an outcome, least of all China and the United States. Such a result is neither desirable nor inevitable. China and the United States bear the primary responsibility to avoid actions that would foster the emergence of a new Cold War. Neither is meeting this challenge adequately. The ending of the division of East Asia into hostile blocks that occurred four decades ago laid the basis for the region's economic miracle. Recreating this division would be an enormous setback. There are better alternatives. Let me briefly review some of the relevant considerations. In the United States, Washington's traditional China policy has been under attack for failing to transform China into a liberal Western-style democracy. These attacks, in my judgment, are based on a misreading of U.S. policy. But the significant thing is that the allegations that U.S. engagement policy toward China has failed have increased pressures to adopt a more confrontational approach. U.S. national security documents mistakenly, in my judgment, lumped China together with Russia as so-called revisionist powers, intent on undermining or overthrowing the global system that emerged following World War II. The chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff has testified to Congress that China will be the principal strategic threat to the United States by 2025. This is a possible but not a preordained outcome. Yet the Trump administration lacks a diplomatic strategy for dealing with China that would reduce the likelihood that China's rise will inevitably threaten the United States. For the moment, the United States is paying lip service to a one-China policy, but is behaving quite differently. In March last year, the U.S. Congress unanimously passed the Taiwan Travel Act calling for the removal of U.S. constraints on exchanges of officials and military officers with Taiwan at the most senior levels, including those with national security responsibilities. In December, these travel provisions were re-endorsed in the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, which President Trump signed on the last day of December last year. In both cases, he signed these acts, which are non-binding, without making a signing statement that he would implement them in a manner consistent with our one China policy, which President Trump has endorsed. The acts call for travel to, China, to uh, Taiwan at levels that for 40 years, under presidents of both parties, have been considered incompatible with conducting unofficial relations with Taiwan. In other words, this is a fundamental effort to change the fundamental principles of having official relations with the People's Republic of China and unofficial relations with Taiwan. Uh, the administration is also actively seeking to deter countries from switching diplomatic relations from Taipei to Beijing, an action, of course, that the United States took 40 years ago. And this position is inconsistent with the U.S. one-China policy. Key administration positions, policy positions relating to China. 
have been left unfilled for an extended period. Somebody already mentioned that Kurt Campbell uh, position as Assistant Secretary for East Asia after two years has not been filled. Departing from 70 years of U.S. leadership in supporting reductions of trade barriers, the United States has launched a tariff war against China in an effort to force China to address long simmering and legitimate dissatisfaction in the administration and in the U.S. business community over protection of intellectual property, cyber attacks, and the imbalance in U.S.-China trade. Some administration officials, as Kurt Campbell mentioned, want to delink U.S. and Chinese um, uh, economies from each other and to restructure global supply chains. Broad segments of U.S. opinion are reacting negatively to Beijing's increased year use of fear and repression to maintain domestic stability and the massive re-education measures underway in Xinjiang. Within the U.S. policy community, there is an increased tendency to see the rivalry between Washington and Beijing for international influence as an ideological struggle between two competing ways of life. This was touched on by some of our earlier speakers. The ideological factor has not been a major factor in U.S.-China relations for much of the last four decades, but now it's re-emerging as a significant factor. In China, the 19th Party Congress in October 2017 outlined an ambitious program for China's rapid rise to a position of global leadership, featuring activism and China's movement to a center stage position in the world. Such bold declarations were certain to intensify the rivalry between China and the United States. Continuing the trend that emerged at the 18th Party Congress in 2012, China's military modernization and capabilities have been delinked from China's defense and development needs and are defined in terms of China's international status and the goal of becoming a military power second to none. This exacerbates the security dynamic that is inherent in China's rapid military modernization. The ongoing campaign against Western influences and the implicit rejection of Western models in the Party Congress work report through the extraordinary emphasis on having every aspect of China's modernization process imbued with Chinese characteristics raises questions about the viability of China's modernization model and the future direction of China's economic development. The perception in the United States is that China is seeking to assert military dominance in the Western Pacific and ultimately to replace the United States as the guarantor of regional security. The scale of China's enlargement of the rocks and shoals that it occupies in the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea and the construction of infrastructure that would permit militarization of these occupation points are seen by Americans as evidence of this strategy. China sees the United States as committed to a containment policy intended to inhibit China, uh, China's further economic development. The Trump administration's campaign against Huawei, already touched on by earlier speakers, and its effort to indict a senior Huawei official are seen as evidence of this intent. Taiwan represents a special aspect of this problem. Key elements of the traditional one-China policy of the United States, as I've mentioned already, are being questioned. There are several aspects to the challenges being raised. That because of Taiwan's emergence as a free and as a vibrant and free democracy, it deserves better treatment by the United States than is possible under the restrictions imposed by our traditional one-China policy. Some people are making this argument. A second argument is that U.S. policy toward Taiwan is outdated, that the government in Taipei no longer claims to be the government of all of China, and that this requires rethinking of the traditional U.S. handling of the one China issue. A third way of thinking is that as Beijing becomes more assertive in challenging U.S. dominance in the Western Pacific, and as the PLA's military capabilities for seeking non-peaceful resolutions of the Taiwan issue increase, 
the United States needs to strengthen its military ties with Taiwan. China and the United States, given these sets of attitudes and actions, both in China and in the United States, need to develop concepts that will enable us to contribute to a revised and more stable international order for the future. Neither China nor the United States is addressing this fundamental issue properly. In a speech four years ago, President Xi Jinping stated that China should be keenly aware of the protracted nature of the contest over the international order. Now, any stable international order must accommodate the interests of China and the United States, along with the interests of other members of the international community. Creating such an order through adaptation and creativity, not through overthrowing the existing national order, should not be seen as a contest between China and the United States, but as a common interest in coming up with a revised international order that is more reflective of the interests of the countries that have been rising, which includes not only China, but India, Brazil, and a host of other countries. Only through engagement with China can we work together on such a fundamental task. An important element in US rivalry with China is American concern over the Chinese belief that the country must become wealthy and powerful in order, once again, to play its proper role in the world. Naturally, this would enable the country to avoid another century of humiliation at the hands of stronger foreign powers. But there's also an element of great power chauvinism built into this concept of military modernization. Put another way, being able to defend the country is China's bottom line requirement for its military modernization, but the ceiling at the top is linked to China's status in the world. And China is claiming that it wants to be one of the first ranking countries in the world, which says that China wants to have a first ranking military. That's not linked to China's defense needs. It's linked to China's prestige as a leading country in the world. That's a disturbing development. A key question, therefore, is whether it is possible to stabilize the military balance between China and the United States at a level that both sides can live with and what such a balance would look like. For conceptual purposes, I would define such a balance as one where each side possesses capabilities sufficient to deter inclinations by the other to use force to resolve serious differences. In other words, China will be deterred from using its military to intimidate its neighbors if the United States maintains a strong presence in the Western Pacific. But equally, the United States can't arbitrarily use our military force in the Western Pacific because of concern about China's reaction. But each side should lack the dominance that could, in the eyes of the other, foster aggressive intentions. In other words, neither side can be so dominant that you have to worry about aggression from the other. But in the case of the United States, this also needs to take into account the need to retain the confidence of our allies. This is a fundamental point. If China's military modernization sets the goal of undermining the credibility of US military capabilities in responding to security threats to Japan and South Korea, China will be attacking a fundamental US interest. But if the United States tries to maintain a dominance, that means that China cannot have confidence in its ability to defend its own national territory, we will be attacking a fundamental Chinese interest. So both sides need to address this problem and we are not engaging adequately to do so. This is one reason why people talk about the emergence of a new Cold War. To a significant, what is needed is for Beijing and Washington to formulate and adhere to wise and coherent longer-term strategies that contribute to peace, stability, and prosperity in East Asia. Equally important is for each country to have the will, resources, and leadership to implement these strategies. In conclusion, let me emphasize that the quality of the relationship between Washington and Beijing has important implications for the Korean Peninsula. That's one reason we're having this conference. The current diplomatic track with North Korea 
in which Pyongyang has recommitted itself to the goal of denuclearization was achieved through effective consultations among Seoul, Beijing, and Washington. All three capitals recognize that the path to denuclearization will be long and arduous. Nevertheless, the addition of symmetry into the U.S. engagement with North Korea has introduced a new element that has been missing in earlier efforts. Moreover, the prospect, the prospect of the first U.S.-North Korean summit in Singapore broke the ice in meetings between Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un. And we've had four summits now between the leaders of uh, China and North Korea. And of course, this supplements the symmetry that was initiated by South Korea and North Korea, which has been an important contributor to this process. Continued close consultations among the ROK, China, and the United States will be necessary to sustain this negotiating track, and this is going to pose significant challenges in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Thank you. Ambassador Roy's well-balanced presentation reminds me of the Dr. Kissinger's final conclusion of his book on China, he suggested the term co-evolution of both China and United States to uh, face the rather better situation each big state will face. Our next speaker will be Daniel Russell. I still remember your speech about two years ago at C CSIS Asia Architecture Conference. It was a kind of very much future-oriented app 4.0 for the operating system for Asia-Pacific reason. I am uh, looking forward to listening to your another forward-looking uh, statement on the U.S.-China relations. Thank you, Professor Ha. Unfortunately, I think we've moved to an analog uh, system in the region. Um, well, congratulations to the Che Institute. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Seoul. It's an honor to be one of the uh, group of really uh, amazing and esteemed, uh, thoughtful uh, voices on foreign policy. Uh, and it's also a bit of a personal tragedy for me to have to speak on U.S.-China relations after Stape Roy. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll try anyway. Um, I begin with regret to say that, not surprisingly, uh, Stape's description of the fragility of the U.S.-China relationship and the, the uh, powerful stresses uh, it's subject to right now is uh, all too accurate. I see a uh, worrisome downward spiral in the U.S.-China relationship uh, with both sides misreading the other, uh, both sides assuming the worst of each other, both sides viewing the other in adversarial terms. Uh, and it's worth asking ourselves, what does each one see when they look at uh, the other? And equally important, what is it that they're not seeing, they're failing to see when they look at the other? You know, Chinese uh, may see, when they look at the United States, something of a dysfunctional political system, uh, discredited in some eyes, uh, and an economic model that looks like it is uh, based on greed and driver, uh, drives uh, serious in social inequities and instabilities. But at the same time, my experience is, as State uh, has pointed out, that there's uh, an inability to recognize the degree to which frustration uh, in the United States has uh, built to a crescendo. I think Americans uh, tend to look at China and see a repressive, authoritarian uh, political system, a predatory, state-directed economic uh, system, uh, but also tend to overlook the uh, growing resentment towards the United States uh, to underestimate the second and third order consequences as more and more people in China begin to conclude that the caricature of the United States is implacably opposed to China's 
uh, taking its rightful place on the international stage is, is true and that there is, in fact, a U.S.-led containment strategy. Um, now, Ed Fulner reminded us, as did Kurt, that these problems in the U.S.-China relationship are nothing new. Um, uh, we have had misgivings about the other side and the other's motives uh, for a long time. We've had uh, vehement objections to the policies and the behaviors of the other side for considerable time. That's always been part of the bilateral relationship. It's true those concerns have been exacerbated significantly by the behavior, the statements, and the policies of both uh, leaders, Xi Jinping as well as by Donald Trump. Kurt and I both served in the Obama administration. We wrestled with these same sets of strategic uh, and uh, political and economic problems. Uh, we got tough at times. We could throw elbows, as President Obama used to put it. But we worked to put a floor under the relationship, uh, a foundation that would absorb stress. And we worked to ensure that that foundation uh, would help prevent an incident, whether it's in Taiwan or the South China Sea or the East China Sea, from precipitating uh, a crisis that proved difficult or unmanageable. We competed with China. We confronted China over uh, objectionable behavior at times. But we also deliberately worked to cooperate. Today, the increasingly adversarial character of our relationship is bringing out the, bo the worst in both sides. It weakens the voices of reform in China, the voices of engagement in the United States. It empowers nationalists in both countries. Uh, it leads to combative policies instead of collaborative ones. It validates negative stereotypes about the other side. It drives both China and the United States to make adjustments to our supply chains, to our relationships, to try to reduce vulnerability. And that comes at a significant cost to each of us. It, it comes at a uh, loss of efficiency, loss of interoperability, and it creates problems for third countries and for the rest of the world. Um, an adversarial relationship robs the world of the kind of uh, necessary cooperation between two major powers on, on global problems, whether it's climate or global health or disaster relief or energy or development and so on. So there's a biblical precept we ought to remind ourselves of hate the sin, not the sinner. The problem is not China. The problem is not the Chinese, although we have problems with Chinese practices and policies, and they have with us. So the solution isn't going to be to vilify China. Uh, there are plenty of Chinese policies that we object to and that we want to change. Yeah, we impose costs. In the past, when the United States has tried to uh, zero in on behavior by China that we objected to. Uh, we tried at the same time to build on common interests. And the record shows that we were able to make some headway, not perfect. Well, today, many people feel that Chinese behavior has gotten worse, uh, that the progress is too slow. So what do we do about it? I mean, certainly we can push harder. Certainly we can use our leverage. Certainly we can make common cause with other countries that have similar concerns. Certainly we can work to empower uh, external allies and internal allies. But as a mentor of mine used to say, you can't kick a man towards you. You can't bully a nation like China and get the kind of results that we say that we're aiming for. Are we after solutions to the problems or are we after surrender? These are different. The deterioration of US-China relations has implications for Northeast Asia that go well beyond North Korea. Uh, all countries are gonna resist being forced to line up behind one side or another in a new Cold War. 
Everybody wants to have it both ways. Every country is smart enough to figure out how to engineer a good relationship with China and a good relationship with the United States. But what that means is that they're also going to be developing coping strategies, when that ranges from playing the US off against China, uh, building arrangements with third countries, whether it's India or ASEAN or the EU, uh, and insulating themselves against the pressure that comes from Washington or from uh, Beijing. And the likely effect is that the influence that the United States or China brings to bear in the Asia Pacific region is going to diminish over time, not, not increase. Moreover, this atmosphere gives a lot of room to maneuver to malicious actors thinking of North Korea, for sure, Russia as well, by giving them more room to uh, leverage the friction that exists uh, among the neighbors. And speaking of friction, I'll conclude just by reminding us all that the unprecedented deterioration in the relationship between Seoul and Tokyo represents yet another aspect of a very serious problem in the region. This is damaging to both Japan and South Korea. It's damaging to the interests of the United States. And it feeds instability in Asia at the very moment when we can least afford it. Thank you. Thanks for another good presentation. As Professor Ajinkwa already gave us a excellent presentation at the plenary, pl preliminary, plenary sessions. He will just join the discussion. And thus, Professor Zhu Feng will give us his presentation. First of all, let me thank President Pop for <coughs> inviting me here. So it's a great honor I can sit in such a distinguished panel. Uh, uh, speaking some sort of Chinese ob observations to our bilateral relations. Um, a couple of uh, points I'd like to run in through and uh, just uh, uh, reflecting some sort of uh, Chinese uh, scholars are thinking. First of all, uh, we are very, very grappling with some sort of such a, a massive change of America's policy of China in the past, we say, less than two years. I think from the top leader over to the bottom class, we are really, really uh, shocked over some sort of such a range and the speed of our bilateral relations just uh, such a, we say, dramatically and also very notably changed. So everywhere we can uh, feel some sort of such a uh, big surprise why U.S. just uh, has run in China in such a very, very uh, reckless way. Such a questions could be easily well uh, funds across my country. Then we also see the Xi Jinping administration really delight to just uh, re-drive uh, some sort of uh, stable relations with the Trump. So just uh, three months later on, after Trump's inauguration, he made it away to uh, uh, Florida's uh, Trump's you know private resort and a meeting with him and uh, just uh, showing his uh, sincerity. In other words, you also probably very familiar ways is she's some sort of uh, self, we say, uh, 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 decorating uh, uh, doctrine to uh, show his sincerity in, in relations with Washington. I mean, building on the new type of uh, power relations, mutual respect, and even just the win-win uh, solutions. But the problem is, just as I mentioned, so I think that most of our American experts will be uh, more careful to action rather than the words. So literally, uh, the Beijing uh, sounds very nice, sounds very positive, but if we turn on to the actions, then we will see a lot of uh, controversy. So what kind of uh, association we can just uh, figure out to some sort of a Chinese policy, uh, we say, in smart terms? So then we see global gap between uh, literal assurance to the Trump administration and uh, some sort of a very stubborn uh, movements by on the Chinese side. I think that's also really a big controversy. The Beijing is uh, lost, uh, is mostly just the uh, way say uh, less uh, aware of. The second one is 
I think the Beijing also underestimates how big American change has taken place on trade issues, domestic politics, and even uh, Trump just has a, uh, initiated uh, U.S. Uh, first you know, the policy. Then we will see all such as things is not a well prepared. Then China's uh, initial response to the uh, Trump administration seemed to me is very problematic. But the problem is we also have to uh, live up to the new reality. We also have to uh, get our relations well uh, managed. But the problem is in one way. You know, just the last year, the, uh, Dr. Kissinger's made a very short visit to Beijing, and he left one words. It's a still resounding across the China. He say, don't think China-U.S. relations will be back to the, to the past. I see there's a lot of some sort of policy weighing, a lot of uh, even uh, uh, theoretical rethinking how to uh, just uh, catch up a real essence of uh, Dr. Kissinger's words. So then, um, my first description is China now is still just a mild in shock. The shock is about why the U.S. changed so massively and how we can respond. But second is, then we will see uh, some sort of the new change of our relations from the U.S. is not productive at all. I think the trade war is real wake up call to China. The reason is, in the past five and six years, China's domestic politics is backing down. That kind of a trend is not just to dissatisfy our American counterparts, also dissatisfy most of Chinese. So we need some sort of re-innovation of Chinese domestic governance, but the problem is in one way. Then if we just have a very brief tracking back the past four decades, how the China's domestic governance could evolve. Usually it happened under the two conditions. One is we have a great masterpiece, just like Deng Xiaoping. He's a really smart, really determined, know how to direct China to sound course. Then what's the other? The other is international pressures, mostly come from the United States. So then it's a, some sort of uh, a faster deterioration of a uh, our relations is not just an alarming reminder, it's also a driver. I'm very honest. So it causes a lot of the new urgency and the new, we say, some sort of uh, such a compelling reason for China to redirect. If that kind of international pr uh, 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 pressure could happen in some sort of a very manageable and, and, and a nice way, I think that will be very conducive to the China's innovation. It also will be very, very conceivably just a constructive to the future's redirection of our bilateral relations. So for the moment, I still see our bilateral relations at the uh, breaking point, but the problem is we should also follow through historical trajectory because the reason is very simple. It's not in the past four decades. It's even, even just a going on longer. In the past 150 years, no powers in the world could just match up the United States to inspire and, in other words, beacon my country for innovation. So this moment, then, where we'll see it's restaging of our American factor. So as I mentioned, very honest, I see some sort of a consequence is partly probably is a disruptive because it's an unanswered test on how Chinese regime could respond. But on the other hand, we also see such a real consequence is productive. But the problem is, U.S. is driver. U.S. is not a savior. My country has never been polarized. We are also very worried. If the U.S. also keep just pressure and pushing hard, that it will trigger the Chinese backlash. And it just uh, has a unexpectedly just to leave some sort of uh, a huge ground for those nationalist Chinese. Then they will be replay some sort of uh, such a historical uh, old, you know, some sort of a reason just like uh, centuries long historical grievance. Then totally will get in the Chinese domestic innovation 
uh, imperative over broad, then such a thing will be really, really risky. So I hope on one hand, our bilateral relations could just serve some sort of a new driver to keep my country evolving. But on the other hand, I hope American driver also could just the house they're always going in some sort of a very expectable and a manageable fashion. Otherwise, that's uh, some sort of a worst case scenario. That means some sort of nationalistic fire between both countries will really, really derail and mislead our countries. Let me come to my conclusion. From my points, I think the new Cold War has taken place between the US and China. But it's not a traditional version of new Cold War. Traditional version of new Cold War is geopolitical split, then some sort of with the ideological rivalry, and even some sort of with the fragmentation of the uh, uh, regional uh, uh, geo uh, strategic landscape. I don't think that China could just uh, have, say, being some sort of peer competitor to the United States uh, moving into the we say, older version of the Cold War. I also published my research paper. I just uh, trying to make clear, if China want to respond to the US, as former Soviet Union did, China will be largely to be second the Soviet Union. That's a truly a very, very worst case scenario for my country. So then there is no reason China could just have to embrace the US on some sort of a confrontational manner as the former United States, former Soviet Union did. On the other hand, I also see the strategic resilience from the Zhongnan High. You know, as I mentioned, um, yes, China-US relations hitting uh, uh, almost every corner of my country, but the problem is the government don't want to just encourage some sort of uh, free debate on what's happening between Washington and Beijing. That kind of a strategic caution usually is come from the twofold. One is no one wants to be, be we say, responsible for the ter deterioration. The other is we also don't know how we should respond very, very firmly and expectedly. So then, um, from this point, I really see the Beijing's political resilience probably will present the new pragmatism in handling of our relations. But unanswered question is, under the Americans' pressure, where the source of a new political enthusiasm could quickly just reform to keep China's political reform just going down the street? That's our question. I hope it calls enough you know, the, 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 the vigilance from the both sides. Without some sort of China's a new determination to keep the, keep the ball of a political reform going down the street. There is quite a little possibility structural change could be expected. And furthermore, our bilateral relations also could be uh, more, we say, wishfully just uh, getting back to the sound that pulse. Thanks. Okay, Professor Fung, thanks for your Chinese version of well-balanced presentations. I will invite, uh, as the next speaker, Dr. Yunyong Wan, currently Professor Emeritus at Seoul National University, former Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, during the 19, early 1990s. And 2003. 2003. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> In addition, he served as a professor of international relations more than 20 years at Seoul National University. Professor Yun. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And first of all, congratulations on the launch of uh, Che Institute for uh, Advanced Studies. And I really hope that uh, I mean, this institute can become intellectual hub in Korea, uh, where all the wisdoms and policy recommendations can come from. 
And uh, thank you very much for inviting uh, to this very important conference, uh, I mean, uh, Ambassador Park and uh, Chairman Che. Um, compared uh, to the 70, uh, seven decades uh, after uh, the World War II, I think we are now entering into a more unstable and dangerous uh, era of international relations nowadays. Uh, there are a few reasons uh, for uh, saying uh, this way, and uh, uh, structural factor, and uh, leadership factor, and value factors. First, uh, structural factor. Uh, in terms of power uh, defined uh, as physical capabilities, as many uh, pundits uh, have already pointed out, we are experiencing a rapid change in global power structure. Uh, for example, in current dollar terms, uh, in 2006, the US economy was 500% bigger than the China's economy. But only 11 years later, the US economy w uh, was just 60% uh, bigger than the Chinese economy. And when there is such a big shift uh, of power in, in a global system, a serious instability tended to follow. Uh, it was mainly because uh, the rising power usually demand uh, uh, a much bigger role and uh, more important uh, in role and influence in global politics. While the existing power used to be reluctant to accept those demands of the rising power, and naturally uh, some kind of tension uh, was there. And if political leaders cannot deal with uh, this kind of tension wisely, uh, they tended to be a war, I mean, sometimes global war. Uh, and uh, a catastrophic example of this uh, was uh, international relations uh, in, the, in, the in the 1890s and uh, uh, 1900s. Uh, especially after uh, 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 German Kaiser Wilhelm II fired uh, Otto von Bismarck uh, as chancellor in 1890. Um, the demanding and the relationship uh, between uh, rising power Germany and the existing power Great Britain was becoming more and more unstable, and there was a rising tension. But no political leaders at that time could deal with that kind of problem, and we all know the results. Uh, I mean, uh, Otto von Bismarck, I think, was an important figure because he was very careful not to frighten Germany's neighboring countries when the power of Germany was rising rapidly. I don't know whether the current political leaders of major powers are as uh, prudent as he was. The second factor is a uh, leadership factor in that regard. I mean, uh, in those uh, I mean, years, I mean, in these, in these days, we don't seem to have a great political leader who can manage this kind of difficult relationship between the rising power and the existing power uh, in, uh, at this uh, critical juncture of uh, systemic change of international relations. For example, we don't have somebody like Bismarck. We don't have somebody like uh, I mean, Metternich, the Austrian chancellor who prepared a post-Napoleonic war international order. Most current leaders uh, seem to be preoccupied with their own domestic politics and don't seem to have wisdom and courage to try to devise a new uh, conceptual framework 
with which political leaders can work together for peace and prosperity in international relations. And as a result, I mean, uh, we, uh, we cannot exclude the possibility of our world uh, drifting toward an era of great confusion. Finally, value factor. I think value or norms matter in international relations, not just uh, physical power. Uh, if there are common values shared by major international actors, they will work as a constraint in, in their international behaviors. And this will, make, uh, this will make international relations more stable and manageable. And also, all the important international institutions created after World War II were based on some kind of values and norms. And uh, all these institutions contributed to international peace and uh, prosperity. Nowadays, these important values, like uh, I mean, liberal democracy, human rights, uh, uh, free trade, multilateralism, which were the foundations of liberal international order in the post-World War II era, are being shaken here and there. And instead, populism and narrowly defined nationalism seem to be gaining influence in uh, domestic politics and the minds of people everywhere. So because of these three factors, I tend to be more uh, or less uh, pessimistic. And uh, I'm somewhat worried about the current state of US-China uh, relations. So far, top leaders uh, of both countries have not shown a strong will to work together for devising a new conceptual framework with which they can stabilize international relations and pursue peace and prosperity in the world. I think if this trend continues, we may be drifting toward uh, the world of the 1930s. In this regard, I have uh, some questions uh, on the wisdom of current policy uh, directions of both the United States and China. Uh, for the United States, I'm wondering whether the US will be able to win if it, w if it wins uh, in competition with China without holding those central values of the post-World War II liberalism. Uh, will, the will the current America First policy which focuses on narrowly defined U.S. interest, guarantee U.S. victory over China from a medium or long-term perspective? I don't know. If the U.S. desert uh, the liberal value itself, it may not be able to persuade China to adopt uh, those liberal values which it deserted. So, Despite the disappointing result of 40-year engagement of China, the U.S., I think, had better, uh, I mean, uh, continue uh, I mean, to engage, I mean, in these uh, values and norms and institutions, liberal values. The U.S should not have deserted those values. Instead, uh, U.S. should have tried to strengthen international coalition of like-minded uh, I mean, countries. For example, I think the U.S. government should have tried to mobilize the support of I mean, uh, like-minded uh, countries, which supports the value of uh, free trade uh, and open, uh, openness before it began a trade war against China. But it didn't do that. Uh, instead, it seems to be uh, adopting a bilateral and transactional approach. For China, uh, I mean, the 19th Party Congress in 
2017 was very important in the sense that uh, through the Congress, they strengthened uh, the authoritarianism uh, in Chinese uh, politics and uh, economic management, and at the same time strengthening President Xi Jinping's power. Uh, however, I'm wondering how long the top leaders of China will be able to suppress the demands of the Chinese middle class and intellectuals for political freedom. Simply speaking, there are 350,000 Chinese students are studying in the United States, and they are experiencing and tasting uh, democracy and political freedom and uh, free market. And they will return soon to their country, China. And I'm, sp I'm skeptical about the possibility of an everlasting disjuncture between open market and closed authoritarian political system. As far as I know, I cannot find any historical example of everlasting disjuncture between those two. I'm concerned about this because as long as uh, the Chinese uh, stick to the authoritarian model and values, there will be much less room for mutual cooperation and as a result, higher possibility to return to the Cold War. For example, how to change the Chinese state capitalism remains the key issue in this trade war between two uh, big powers. Let me briefly comment on the impact of US-China uh, competition on Korea. In short, uh, Korea is, the, is, is one of the countries which will suffer most from this intensifying competition between the United States and China. Actually, Korea, as a small peninsula surrounded by big power, has been experiencing this kind of competition for a long time. For example, when uh, Japan invaded uh, Korea in 1592, uh, I mean, the, that was one uh, I mean, early case of uh, I mean, competition between maritime power and land power. Toyotomi Hideyoshi demanded the Korean, I mean, the Chosen government uh, to, to uh, let them pass Korean Peninsula to invade uh, Ming Dynasty. We had, uh, I mean, uh, Sino Japanese War in 1894. Ten years later, we had a uh, uh, Russo-Japanese war and uh, I mean, uh, division of Korean Peninsula in, 40, in 1945. All these are the examples of strategic rivalry among big powers. So we are not supposed to, to be surprised even, uh, even in case we uh, continue to witness uh, ever-intensifying competition between the United States and China. Uh, but I think, uh, as uh, I already mentioned, uh, Korea will suffer uh, uh, severely if this uh, trend continues. Uh, but I would like to add that, I mean, the Korean issue is in some sense an exceptional issue in the sense that this issue area is the only, I mean, uh, only issue area where some kind of optimism is working. Uh, as the result of President Trump's, uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, successful persuasion of President Xi Jinping, uh, I mean, uh, in order to mobilize full support or cooperation of the Chinese government in sanctioning North Korea, and also as the result of his decision to engage North Korea uh, politically, I think there was some important convergence of North Korea policies among three countries, the United States, 
uh, Korea, South Korea, and China. And this kind of uh, uh, cooperation continues. And uh, if they succeed in I mean, getting some progress, making some uh, substantial, uh, meaningful uh, progress in terms of denuclearizing North Korea, I think there will be probably positive spillover impact in other issue areas I mean, where uh, China and the United States compete uh, severely, like uh, I mean, South China Sea, Taiwan issue, or trade issue, or something like that. So I hope uh, I mean, uh, those three countries uh, be able to maintain this kind of po positive momentum for the time being. Uh, and I, uh, I sincerely hope that uh, I mean, China would not I mean, the unilaterally uh, loosen uh, international sanction against uh, North Korea because it will uh, make matters much more complicated and probably the Chinese government uh, will not uh, want to do that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Yun. Based on historical experiences, he gave us a very well organized presentations on the US-China relations. As the final speaker, Professor Kim hung Gyu, he is now one of the leading scholars on this specific issue, not only in Korea, but also in East Asia. Professor Kim? Yeah, thank you very much, dear. We witness entering the period of turbulence. I really hope the, uh, the Choi jong Institute for Advanced Studies uh, can be hope for intellectual uh, communication in these uh, difficult times. And then also I really uh, appreciate tremendous efforts done by the, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 President uh, the uh, Jae and then also the, uh, the uh, Park. Um, it is barely a decade ago since Thomas uh, Freeman's famous book, The World is Flat, described globalization as a seemingly unstoppable trend, along with deepening interdependence of the world giant economies, the United States and China. However, it doesn't look that way anymore. Since the election of Donald Trump, the world has begun to buckle. There are several implications of the US-China strategic comp uh, competition in various areas. First, the 40 years of the U.S. engagement policy to China virtually ended. The United States identified China as a strategic competitor and defined it as a revisionist to the current international order. Second, the United States is retreating from the liberal international order. The United States seems to have decided that it should start to disentangle its economic relationship with China. China in the long run may favor decoupling from the United States as well, seeking to establish its own sphere of influence. Trump's America first policy and Xi Jinping's Chinese dream goal are not likely comparable under the current situations. However, it's still uncertain of what kind of international order will be shaped, Pax Americana or Pax Seneca. Sir, so the strategy competition is likely to have a negative impacts on denuclearization of North Korea. The United States uh, pursue conflicting goals by identifying China as a strategy competitor and launching trade wars, meanwhile seeking cooperation on the North Korean nuclear issues from uh, China. These conflicting uh, policies have likely negative impacts, of course, and then force, furthermore, Economy may enter further recession due to the uh, U.S.-China ongoing trade war, which brings more uncertainties and instability in this region. Finally, Japan likely uh, precipitates being a normal state, including strengthening of its military preparation. These competitions uh, certainly destabilized security environment in this region, and Japan even worries about the vacuum of the U.S. presence in the future. 
We will witness revival of the political uh, uh, realism and great power politics in this region. John Mearsheimer once indicated Chinese peaceful rise is impossible. And conflict with the United States is inevitable. Is it inevitable for the United States and China to go for the crisis? Geopolitics surrounding the Korean Peninsula turns into being worse. Uh, once uh, Robert Kaplan mentioned Korea is uh, in a sheltered zone, of course we don't want to be. Unfortunately, there is uh, no regional security mechanism or architecture established. We start being afraid of the vacuum of the U.S. presence and alliance system in this region. We are not sure of how much Chinese dream provides benefits to this uh, region. The image of China as a sharp power still remains strong in the heart of the people. There are six scenarios for regional orders uh, possible. First one is establishing a, a community and a rule-based order. Second one is Pax Americana. Third one is Pax Sinica. Fourth one is creating new balance of power but still stay unstable. Fifth, we are entering into chaotic situations. Six, decoupling each other and establishing its own sphere of influence. We are entering into the stage of in between a chaotic situation and uh, creating a new balance of power, probably ending up divorcing instead of a fierce fighting that is decoupling between the United States and China. For us, the, these competing U.S.-China are likely like swirling typhoons coming to us, absorbing adjacent countries into the orbits of their own influence. Nobody can confidently make judgments for the future in this strategic competition between the U.S. and China, in which the capacities of internal balancing and the technological innovation in the area of the so-called fourth industrial revolution likely to be the keys to win over. For the time being, we can anticipate with the perspectives of the fourth industrial revolution in which the winner takes all, uh, the strategic competition will be quite intense in technology and science. Such competition will also extend over military and ideas, cyber, and even space. I seriously worry about weaponization of the space in the near future beyond the militarization of the space. I am also afraid that the rest of the two great powers may be put under serious pressure to choose sides in the near future. There are prescriptions from schools of international relations, political realism saying about the balance of power, political liberalism saying international regime building and the economic interdependence, and constructivism saying shaping new culture, idea, and intersubjectivities. However, any of them has not been able to provide the exact answer to these coming challenges in this region. Probably the answer is combination of such prescriptions. Then the question is how? What kind of combination we are gonna have? Balancing, regime building, forming a sense of a commonality or community are all necessary. In addition, to provide a space for restraints from or balancing in and mediating the competition, we may need the role of third parties in this case. I suggest to enlarge the role of middle powers, and also it is necessary to secure an existential space for small and middle powers in the new era of bipolar uh, strategy competition. We need to increase middle power intelligence, which requires much more creativities, practic practitioners' minds, and ideas of complex geopolitics beyond middle power hood, which is a positioning in the middle of great power politics or beyond uh, middle power manship, which is the required role of middle powers in the international order, maybe much more than these. Uh, in the morning, uh, Vice Minister of the uh, uh, you know, uh, Foreign Affairs, Choyan, saying 
uh, we want to be a smart dolphins. Of course, we don't want to be a shrimp between the giant whales, and every country wants to be a smart dolphin. But still, I think we, still, I mean, uh, South Korea should remain as uh, maybe a mackerel. Uh, I, I really hope we can be a glowfish or at least puff fish. But I sincerely hope the United States and China can find a way of engagement and also inclusiveness for the, uh, this small world. We have to seriously question what kind of civilization we want to reach for, what kind of legacies these strategy competition will leave for the rest of human beings. Uh, we have to think about seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim. Uh, it seems that we do have about an half an hour for our discussion. Let me moderate the discussion. First of all, as the presentation goes with the American side, the discussion starts from the Chinese side and next Korean uh, speakers and finally US speakers. Thus, the two of the Chinese speakers will give comments or questions on both, in particular, US presentation and also Korean presentation. After that, the two Korean speakers will give their time to have a comments on uh, both sides' uh, presentation, and finally, uh, U.S. speakers will respond to the comments and questions from the, uh, both both sides. In addition, to save the times, I always. Uh, received these several comments from the floor. Most of the comments uh, from the floor goes directly to the specific speakers. I already gave to that question. This, when you have a turn, you will answer briefly to the question from the floor. And finally, I, if possible, I'm thinking about, I'm, I do hope that if we can give a small gift or a souvenir to the uh, inaugural uh, conference of this uh, very much important meetings, uh, most of the speakers, uh, they gave us the presentations. We do need a kind of third way to avoid the new type of Cold War between two big powers. In that sense, we do need a kind of new concept, such as, as I introduced the co-evolution, Dr. Kissinger, or several, well, during the previous governments, Scott Campbell's man, uh, coined the term of uh, power balance instead of balance of power. There's such kind of the new concept we do need. Of course, from the China side, well, we do have a, we all have a new term, a new type of international relations in the new era, but it, it is a little bit uh, not more specific. What does that mean, that new type, which can satisfy not only the US, China, and also several other key major actors in Korea, both South and North, Japan and India and the Southeast Asian countries. So that is final hope I would like to suggest. If you can do some, give some words on that kind of uh, suggestions. So uh, I would like to give the chance for Dr. Cha ching to say something. On well, thank you very much. I enjoyed the previous discussions very much. Uh, I think they are all balanced uh, with a lot of nuances. Uh, I just want to have one point to make. Uh, I think the atmosphere, political atmosphere in the, uh, on China-US relations uh, in Washington is much worse than <laughs> in Beijing <laughs> at the moment. Uh, uh, you know, the, in, in Beijing, I think uh, there is a lot of cool 
reassessment at the at the stage, uh, and uh, some people think that maybe you know uh, some of the pressures are good for China, you know? uh, like uh, more protection of intellectual property rights. You know, China wants to become an innovative country, <laughs> a country of innovation, and uh, better protection of intellectual property rights is in China's interest as well as the U.S. interest, right? And, and, and of course, uh, we need to have a better business environment. You know, basically, the Chinese government has been saying that we want the market pl to play a critical role <laughs> in allocating resources. Uh, so, in a way, to change the role of the government. Uh, uh, but, uh, but then, uh, you know, um, we're not making a lot of progress in that direction, and now a little external pressure is maybe good. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, I think on the part of the uh, US, uh, I think there, we are in a stage of anxiety and, and also uh, emotions. Uh, so basically, uh, it seems to me that, that China is more, that, I mean, the, the people are focusing more on the negative side of China and negative side of China-US relations now. But at the expense of ignoring the positive side of the, uh, 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 of the relationship. Actually, we have a lot of shared interests uh, between the two countries. Uh, economically, I mean, the, the U.S. has benefited tremendously from China-U.S. trade and economic and investment, as well as China. Okay. Uh, this is a fact, but it has often been ignored now. And also, uh, you know, uh, the, the two countries have benefited from the, the fact that we are not, at, you know, we are not enemies. So we don't have to spend a lot of resources on, on, on buying weapons, maneuvering, and, 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 and against each other. And also, the two sides uh, have, uh, you know, uh, have a lot of cooperation on global governance issues, immigration, uh, anti-corruption, uh, money laundering, you know, s even cyber to some extent, okay. And, and also the two sides are stakeholders. I, I think, I st I, I think uh, Bob Zelik was is still right that China and the U.S. are stakeholders of the existing international order, okay. And, and on values, people are saying nowadays are exaggerating the differences between the two countries in terms of values. But if you look at China, it's, it's very interesting that, you know, we have a 24 character of core values, which is posted everywhere in China. And that, those 24 character core values include things like democracy, freedom, <laughs> rule of law, all these things that the Americans are standing for. Uh, so, in practice, of course, we, we have a huge we have huge differences uh, because of because of the different political considerations. But in terms of values, the gap at the level of ideas, the gap is not that great. Okay, so it's time for us to not just to focus on the differences, uh, but also you know, take into consideration of our shared interests and aspirations. And in a way, we need a balanced consideration for us to develop a constructive uh, and mutually beneficial policy and manage our relationship uh, in that direction. Thank you. Okay, there is one more question from the floor. It's a kind of a little bit more general questions. To what extent could the role of government and state be tolerated or contained by the U.S. or the global community? If any one of you would like to respond to that kind of a little bit broader questions, well, you can do that in the procedures. The I don't fully understand. To what extent could the role of government or state be tolerated or contained by the U.S. or the global community? That is the question. 
Okay, so may I just uh, uh, yeah, okay, you explain and uh, answering very, very briefly. For, first of all, for example, what's the fundamental factors behind the uh, quick uh, deterioration of relations? Of course, on the American side, many of the experts believe it's a failure of the engagement policy of China. But on the Chinese side, we consider the engagement of the policy of China has never been gorgeously achieved. Look at the past of China's 40 de four decades achievement. Partly, of course, it's the Chinese hardworking, but partly is the U.S. welcoming China and leading China to international community. That kind of U.S.-led globalization, not just the benefit of China, also benefit of both economic and the commercial. So then uh, we consider uh, U.S. role in the eyes of China is some sort of very complicated. On the one hand, of course, as I mentioned, U.S. is a big uh, a leader to uh, redirect China's trajectory. But on the other hand, we also see today's world power structure remain just a very uh, unipolar. So U.S. is a dominator. U.S. is uh, just the house they uh, supervising the, all the uh, uh, roles of the countries. So then, by the end, we also see what is happening between the US and China is also very spontaneous. It's easy to explain. This is just because China's re-emergence mostly happening under the context of American-centered, American we we'll say, uh, unit plurality. So then when the power transition, even just a little bit, just a resurfing, then we will see U.S. hitting back. So then we consider that kind of a thing is what Chinese deserve. You know why? Because the world of politics is always a dirty job. So it's useless for Chinese to crying over spilled milk. So why U.S. taking China so hard? And then why the White, White House? Uh, Washington DC just trying to close in the door of the uh, market access for Chinese investors to the United States. But the problem is, I really like the uh, Ambassador Loy and the, uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Russell's uh, comments. So then we need to uh, figure out some sort of, uh, we we'll say, reciprocal approach. So I think reciprocity is an unbelievably powerful term. The President Trump pick it up to, we say, remaking the Chinese thinking. He asked a reciprocity in trade, but Chinese now is also a word term to ask the reciprocal, some sort of uh, uh, approach to China. For example, AI, we say, and the future's horrible possibility of a weaponization. I see some sort of a redemptation by the both country should be reciprocal. Thanks. Okay, Professor Yun, your turn. Um, I have questions to uh, Dr. Chia and Ambassador Roy. Um, uh, and, uh, I mean, uh, Professor Chia, I mean, in your previous uh, presentation in the plenary session, you implied that there may be some kind of linkage between, uh, I mean, the uh, U.S. Uh, China competition, strategic competition on the one hand, and their cooperation on the issue of North Korea. And uh, would you elaborate a little bit more on that point? Because that is very important issue, which will matter in near future probably, in a matter of months or years. And that will affect the progress of denuclearization negotiation very much. So I, 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 I would like to listen more uh, I mean, uh, on that uh, specific issue. To Ambassador Roy, um, I mean, I'm uh, curious about one, one uh, important uh, question. That is, what do you think about the post-Trump America, I mean, the, the, I mean, the uh, Trump era we are experiencing, is this a kind of temporary exceptional period or are we entering into a totally new world? I mean, the, I mean you have 
mentioned many, I mean, uh, insightful, I mean, uh, points about domestic uh, politics of uh, United States, and uh, I would appreciate your comments on that point. Not easy question, probably to answer, <laughs> but. Uh, 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 instead of direct response from Dr. Cha ching and Ambassador Roy, why the Professor Kim first and then? Yeah, okay. Um, I think there are uh, four assumptions of the U.S. hedging strategy or engagement policy to China. And the first one is China will focus on the domestic problems. And the second one is the Chinese economy in trouble will act within the current norms and institu institutions of the world. And then the third one is uh, feeble Chinese the, uh, uh, military capabilities will continue. And fourth one is uh, China will be still continue to be a status quo power to the current international uh, order. Um, however, um, uh, sh after Xi Jinping uh, gained power, and then he uh, uh, specially uh, emphasized on the Chinese characteristic of uh, you know, uh, politics, ideas, even technologies. China is building their own GPS and supercomputers, and then also other GA, G, uh, 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 GI, and then uh, all these kind of uh, new technologies, which uh, has a certain nature of a uh, winner takes, takes all. Uh, so, the um, uh, United States uh, uh, seems to be quite be threatened and also the frustrated with this kind of, uh, you know, uh, the uh, situation is, is uh, coming. And then also the United States perceive uh, China as uh, uh, them instead of us. Uh, because we uh, uh, assume that uh, if China develops their economy and then there will be uh, maybe political liberalization, and then also the close to the, the civilization to the uh, you know, uh, Western world. But now it turns out to be a wrong. So uh, we have to you know, uh, narrow the gap, but the problem is how? And then, uh, so uh, my question is, the, uh, is there any third way uh, in this uh, you know, strategy competition uh, for the side of the United States or China? That's the, my question. You? Um, I have a question. If you don't mind, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a question from the audience. Uh, the question is, as you know, the US and China are competing as the existing and new power. And he asked me to uh, show some examples from this kind of competition, probably in terms of Korean Peninsula uh, situation. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, this kind of competition began to be more and more visible since around the early 2000s, after uh, some uh, intensive uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, economic interaction between two governments uh, since the opening of diplomatic relations in 1992. And uh, as uh, economic uh, relations uh, deepen between two countries, uh, I mean, Chinese government, from Korean perspective, a Chinese government began to show some uh, I mean, uh, symptoms of their uh, I mean, uh, intention to utilize uh, economic uh, uh, relationship for political purposes. Uh, in 2009, when President Lee myung uh visited uh, China, uh, I think it was 2008 uh, or something like that, uh, I mean, the uh, spokesperson, uh, spokesperson of Chinese uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, I mean, uh, made a statement that uh, US-ROK alliance is the legacy of the Cold War confrontation, which implies that they want this alliance uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, disappear. There are many other examples. I mean, the recent example, I mean, somebody already showed that example of Assad deployment and uh, Chinese retaliation against Assad, I mean, uh, economic uh, sanction uh, in retaliation for uh, South Korea's I mean, deployment of Assad. Uh, uh, a few years ago, and uh, I mean, for example, I mean, the fact that uh, President Xi Jinping met uh, uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un for four times in a year, after six years of a very sour relationship, I think that's the indication 
how China has been sensitive on this uh, issue of strategic competition. That kind of, I mean, shift of uh, uh, China's foreign policy toward North Korea began uh, only after <coughs> the US-led, uh, I mean, denuclearization negotiation uh, has started. So there are many examples like that. Okay, next, Ambassador Roy, your turn. Let me, um, let me address your, your question about whether after President Trump, the United States will go back to an earlier uh, way of looking at the world or whether uh, we will uh, be a different country. So it's a very good question. Americans are thinking very seriously about this question. I think the most accurate way to think about it is we won't go back. We have changed. Because the factors that have caused us the change have affected American attitudes broadly. One of the most foolish actions that President Trump has taken in his presidency was right at the beginning when he walked away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But, but his opponent in the election, Secretary Clinton, also walked away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, even though she had helped to negotiate it and had pushed for it. So what you have to think about is the United States, after the high point of the Cold War world, which was when we fought the successful Gulf War and ended up having Japan and Saudi Arabia pay for the cost of it, very low casualties, very clearly defined war goals, withdrawal from Iraq as soon as we had accomplished the expulsion of Iraq from Kuwait, we ended up in continuous warfare in Iraq and Afghanistan, tried to engage in nation building. We, if you recall, Deputy Secretary of Defense Wolfowitz said the war in Iraq would cost us $80 billion. Uh, it has cost us several trillion dollars, and we're still paying the cost of having destabilized uh, the situation in Iraq. ISIS is a product of the fact that the Sunnis in Iraq were ousted from their governing position and have no role in the current government uh, in Iraq. Uh, we also have the Afghan problem that we have not been able to um, uh, dissociate ourselves from. The second problem was the change in the nature of our financial system, whereby instead of primarily directing capital to where it can be used most effectively, it has become a vehicle for funneling profits into the pockets of our most wealthy citizens. So this has caused stagnation in middle class incomes and a concentration of wealth in the 1% and especially the top 10% that we have not had before. And then we had the impact of globalization, which is being blamed for having caused the loss of jobs, manufacturing jobs, even though that was primarily attributable to the emergence of the new technologies such as the internet and computers and uh, things of that sort. So it's ironic that jobs have become a big issue in the United States at a time of unprecedentedly low unemployment. We now have unemployment in the range of 4%, whereas in the old days, it was considered unprecedented to get below 5%. But the nature of the change has been shift from manufacturing jobs over into service jobs, but not loss of jobs. So this has caused broad dissatisfaction in the United States, which is not being expressed in a coherent way. For example, I was born during the Depression. Fortunately, I was born in China, so my parents didn't have to sell me into slavery in order to pay the rent. Um, <laughs> But the lesson from the Great Depression was raising tariffs in developed countries 
is a ticket for destroying your own economy. It's one thing for new countries to try to use tariffs to protect infant industries. But the idea of using tariffs as a way of trying to force jobs to move back from abroad into your own country means you're trying to force higher prices on the American people. And there's been no intelligent discussion of this in the United States. So what we have in the United States is the broad dissatisfaction over the way that money has captured control of our political system. And the Congress is not addressing the questions that it needs to address. The degradation in our infrastructure because of the costs of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq has created real dissatisfaction spread across the American people which is being reflected in the election of President Trump. So even if President Trump goes, we are going to have to address this problem of dissatisfaction. The difference is that President Trump was opposed by most of the most capable and experienced people in his own party. So the Trump administration is the least experienced American administration in over 100 years. And after President Trump, if it's the Republicans, they will be able to draw on a large resource of talent, which has not been available to President Trump uh, from the Republican Party. And the Democratic Party does not have that problem. So it can draw on a large cadre of experienced government officials who can help to try to sort out, straighten out this problem. But we are not going to be the same country until we get away from believing that tariffs are the way to go, until we get away from rejecting globalization, which is not the way to go. Uh, uh, the the post-World War II economic policies have produced a period of unprecedented global prosperity. And an era of high tariffs is not going to be able to sustain that pattern. So, that's my answer. Expect something different. I think the possibility for straightening out our problems will be greater after President Trump. Because I think the policies that President Trump is pursuing are not well designed to get us where we need to go. Uh, even though he has some credit. I, I think he deserves real credit for having created the negotiating track on North Korea, which is very important to South Korea. But he's also forced South Korea at the same time to renegotiate chorus uh, the free trade agreement to pay more for ha maintaining our troops here and to raise questions of how, about how reliable we are in case uh, conflict were to emerge in East Asia. So these are some of the trade-offs that we face. Let me answer a question from the audience just quickly here. It's the United States is undermining its own values of liberalism and human rights. So what are the next American values? Will the United States change or develop a new American value? Uh, the, the answer is the United States is unusual because from the very beginning of the foundation of our country over 200 years ago, we stood for values that we violated in an extreme fashion in the nature of our domestic system. We had slavery for 70 years that was officially part of our system, was written into our constitution. We tried to solve it through the political system. We failed. We had to fight a bloody civil war, the bloodiest war of the 19th century. Uh, and then we had Jim Crow segregation laws for nearly another 100 years. Through all that period, we had to struggle to deal with that question. It was embedded in the American political system that we had to struggle with that issue. We didn't give the vote to women until the uh, beginning of the, until 1919. Uh, 1919, that's 120 years after the United States was founded. We suddenly discovered that women were equal, had equal rights to the vote. But that didn't occur because of the wisdom of the American system. It occurred because of a 50 year struggle by suffragettes in the United States to force the stupid men of the United States to recognize that women 
we're equal human beings with the male population. So struggle over human rights is embedded in the American system, in the American tradition. When I was ambassador in China, I was instructed to get fundamental improvements in seven specific areas of human rights in one year, one year, mind you, or China would not get most favored nation trade status. Well, guess what? Ten years later, we went into the Iraq War, and we have violated every one of those seven areas of human rights. We hid prisoners from the International Committee of the Red Cross. We did not provide habeas corpus over the people we were holding. We endorsed torture as a way of gaining information to deal with it. All of these are fundamental violations of American principles. So what you can expect from the United States is that we will continue to uphold principles that we ourselves do not respect adequately. So what you should admire in the United States is that we don't hide these questions. They're all part of our political system, and we fight for that. And that's why other countries can expect the United States to be on their side when they carry out their own struggles in favor of human uh, rights. But don't expect us to be white knights in shining armor. We have enormous domestic problems, and what's good about it is we know we have problems and we're trying to straighten them out. Dernier question. It really seems to be my fate in life to always have to follow <laughs> State Roy. <laughs> it's not fun. Um, I'd add a small piece to what Stape said on the uh, issue of what uh, to expect from the United States after the Trump administration, which is this. Uh, regardless of the extent to which the U.S. society and the U.S. political establishment is capable of, of changing in 2020 or 2024, uh, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the international situation, particularly the situation in the Asia-Pacific, that will greet a new president of the United States itself has fundamentally altered. And many of the lessons that have been absorbed by Asian partners uh, over the last few years will not be unlearned, nor will many of the coping mechanisms and competing institutions that have evolved uh, will not be disbanded. Uh, I, w I was told not long ago by a very senior uh, Asian diplomat that uh, even if a new administration came in and reversed the policies of the Trump administration, 180 percent, even if Barack Obama returned to the White House, that th the whiplash that he felt or these countries in Asia feel from the reversal of U.S. policy from Obama to Trump, from Trump to the next one, uh, has so undermined the confidence in the sustained, sustained character and the dependability of U.S. policy uh, that countries in the Asia Pacific feel compelled to diversify, to reduce their dependence on the United States. So that's another factor that will be changed. The the question that I was asked to answer is, do I think Trump understands Xi Jinping and the Chinese way of thinking, not just politically, culturally, and historically? Um, I will cite the preeminent uh, authority on Donald Trump, who is Donald Trump, uh, <laughs> who has said and boasted that he relies on his gut, uh, his instinct, uh, and is famously contemptuous of uh, analysis and in fact, uh, made a, uh, almost a fetish of uh, disregarding the input and advice from uh, specialists. He used that rejection of expertise in his campaign for president uh, successfully. And there's every reason to think that that has further validated such an approach in his mind. Um, but as Stape alluded to the uh, staggering unintended consequences of uh, U.S. engagement, uh, U.S. intervention in the Middle East. I think we can see uh, significant and uh, an adverse downstream consequences from 
ill-considered and cavalier uh, actions and policies towards China in the first instance and towards North Korea in the second instance. And, and it is in the interests of the United States and in the world to uh, be clear-eyed about what those downstream risks are and to begin finding ways to mitigate them. Thanks. Professor Chachingo, you have the chance to respond uh, very briefly okay, from you, the uh, Professor Yun. Thank you, uh, Professor Yun. Uh, in what ways, uh, the question is, in what ways uh, U.S. tension, U.S.-China tension would affect uh, uh, China's approach to North Korean denuclearization? I think there are two ways. One is, uh, you know, the nu North Korean nuclear policy, uh, uh, China's policy toward North Korean nuclear issue is a very contentious one in China. Okay, there are people who believe that this is an American problem. It's not China's problem. And there are people who believe that this is China's problem, so China should work with the U.S. and deal with it. Okay. And U.S.-China tension means that the former group <laughs> may gain uh, ascendance in their voice. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, these people would say, oh, you know, now China, the U.S. Uh, is so bad to us, why should we help the U.S.? Okay. The second uh, uh, way is uh, if China and the U.S., uh, I mean, if there is a possibility that China and the U.S. would become enemies, okay, if you look at the current situation, I mean, uh, many people are thinking that it's very likely yeah, or it's quite likely at least, okay. Then there is an incentive for China to hedge okay, against this kind of a situation. Okay. One of the ways, one of the things that you, you need to do is not to make, not to uh, make enemy of, of North Korea, right? By putting too much pressure on North Korea. Okay. Why, you don't need one more enemy, right? <laughs> Enemies, your enemies, enemies, your friend. Okay. And also, uh, to keep North Korea as a nuclear uh, weapon state so, that, so, so as to make trouble for the U.S. Okay. Uh, if China and the U.S. really become enemies. Okay. So, so people, have, people logically would calculate uh, and, and, tr uh, and this some, this would affect uh, policy considerations one way or the other. Okay. Thank you. Okay. In comparison with the current deteriorating situation between U.S. and China, our presentation and discussion goes in a little bit constructive way. I do hope that this new type of discussions and this sessions will give a positive impact on the policy making of both United States, China, and other key actors in the Asia and Pacific. If not, it seems that we will have to pay very much expensive uh, fee for the historical lesson. Thanks very much for the excellent presentations, uh, constructive discussions, and also the full house audiences. Thank you very much.